Okay, it looks like the waiting room is empty, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Jacqueline. I am one of the physical therapists at the West Loop location of Bluebird, um, and I'm joined by Nyla as well, if you want to go ahead. Hello, I am the department head for physical therapy at North Center. So today we just wanted to talk about um, toileting trouble and um, sort of look at it from a physical therapy perspective um, in terms of some of the causes and some of the ways that we can address it. Um, so specifically today, we're going to be talking about this condition called bowel and bladder dysfunction. So of a few of the things that we want to do today, first, obviously, introduce this condition and talk about um, why it might occur and um, some of the warning signs that we might see, um, ways to recognize if your child might be um, at risk for developing bowel bladder dysfunction or if they're already um, experiencing some of these symptoms. And then of course the bulk of the presentation is gonna be some of the ways that we can address it, um, as well as some simple strategies that you could potentially use at home to prevent and um, potentially treat this condition. So first, what is bowel bladder dysfunction? Essentially, this uh, condition just describes any urinary symptoms that are related to or associated with constipation. And most often the, um, the, the way this goes is constipation is actually causing these urinary symptoms. Um, and when we talk about the urinary symptoms, it is essentially just referring to um, when these occur in a child of potty training age. So anyone who might be um, looking to start potty training or maybe uh, starting the potty training uh, process already. Um, if we're seeing these symptoms, they can be a bit of a, a red flag to look for this condition. So this topic was chosen mostly as a physical therapist at Bluebird. I was noticing so many of my kids were suffering from constipation or seemed to be having just a lot of trouble with their toilet training. It was really prolonged or even after they were toilet trained, they were having recurrent accidents. Um, and so I looked into it and I was really surprised to find this bowel bladder dysfunction um, and how common it is, especially in children who are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, essentially a huge chunk of the population that we see here at Bluebird. Um, and even more, it's really often missed in these children. Um, if they're having these symptoms, they can just go for years sometimes um, and not have it addressed. Um, and also just to give you an idea of the scope, um, one study found that 55% of children with autism spectrum disorder struggle with bowel or bladder symptoms. And a lot of times it's related to this um, specific condition. It was also chosen just with knowing how impactful um, toilet trouble can be on families. It's obviously very stressful and frustrating if you're dealing with prolonged toilet training or even if your child has already been toilet trained and now is having recurrent accidents or even has regressed to the point where um, they can no longer control their bladder or if they're having BM accidents. It's obviously expensive and time consuming as well. Pull-ups are not cheap um, and neither is new clothing. It can have an impact on health, especially if the child is having recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, and then it's a really stressful experience for the child as well. Um, you know, having recurrent accidents is embarrassing. It can be really upsetting, especially if it's occurring outside of the home. Um, and that can actually lead to some changes in self-esteem and even behavior. So this is definitely something that we as providers and caregivers wanna keep an eye out for and wanna be able to address as soon as possible. So the group of muscles that actually help with keeping continence of fecal or urinary, uh, urinary uh, system is the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor supports your organs. It prevents the leakage from your bl bladder and from your bowels because it closes up the holes that your child's pee and your child's poop will be eliminated from. And the body has this very interesting system of stretch signals where once the bladder has expanded to its full capacity, 
it will send a signal up to the brain to let the body know that it needs to go find a bathroom to eliminate. And it's the same situation with the colon. Once enough bowel, enough stool has collected inside of the large intestine, the colon is going to expand and send that signal to the brain to have your child find a toilet to go and eliminate. Go to the next slide. So, as you can see from the diagram, the colon and the bladder are very closely related. So often problems with one system can cause problems with the other. If you have an overfilled colon, that can cause bladder issues as well. And there are a couple main reasons. First, as you can see, the bowel is full, especially with harder, drier stool during constipation, it presses into the bladder, which doesn't allow it to expand. And as a result, we may have to go more often or more suddenly. This mass can also interrupt communication of the nerves, the stretch response system that I mentioned. In the same way, our foot, when it falls asleep, if sometimes it's pressed into our leg, the compression of the, the compression prevents the nerves from telling the brain it's time to go potty until it's too late. So these pelvic floor muscles also have to work extra hard to support the extra weight. So they can get really overworked and tense. And sometimes the body just takes on as much as it can. And as soon as the pelvic floor muscles are done with holding all that stool, they will just release. So in my time as the pelvic floor therapist, um, I have actually seen kids improve from their urinary incontinence after we've addressed constipation. And then they will start to what seems like regress. We'll see a lot more urinary incontinence again, but it's really the bladder and the bowels reorganizing themselves because that stretch response is starting to, to occur again. The bladder is reducing in size, the colon is reducing in size, and the body is trying to figure out how to work with this new found size. So we might see some regression before we see the progression again with, with uh, treating constipation. So signs that you might, your child might have some kind of incontinence is immediately toileting, especially if they're always having a BM as soon as they go home is a sign of voluntary holding of their stool. And having nighttime accidents or nap time accidents can also indicate that the bladder is not fully emptying prior to going to sleep or due to the pelvic floor dysfunction. And some other signs can be having recurring UTIs and having infrequent voiding or sudden urges during the daytime. So, in our practice with, with a GI, the bristol stool chart is strongly used because the stool can really help you tell what kind of issues are going on with the body. If you have very loose stool, like diarrhea, that could indicate that there's some kind of infection going on within the stomach. But if you have very small pellets or very long, hard, dried stool, that's a very good indication that there's constipation going on. And having a bowel movement less than twice a week within a month span is also a very good indication of possible constipation that's occurring. Your child might also complain of frequent abdominal pain. They might be sluggish around the house, not wanting to move around as much as they usually do. They are straining a lot to use the bathroom, or trying to avoid or have a, have a bowel movement occur, and they might have a decrease in their appetite. So outside of having pelvic floor dysfunction, things that I like to rule out before really diving into this practice is making sure that the child doesn't have a sensory issue with using the bathroom. Are they tolerating the smells in the bathroom, all the noises in the bathroom? Um, are they flexible with being able to stop what they're doing and go and use the bathroom to actually eliminate what's in their body? Is there other types of dysfunction that's 
that have been rolled out by providers such as like neurogenic bladder or other kinds of of colon issues like Hirschsprung's disease or or um, irritable bowel syndrome. So if we've explored those ideas and there has not been any resolving with your child's incontinence, then we look into constipation and, and the pelvic floor muscles doing their job. Are they strengthened enough? Are they relaxing enough? Is there good communication between between that stretch response and actual positioning on the toilet. Abdominal weakness or having low tone is also an area of possible cause for constipation. There's that imbalance, as I was saying, and not being able to actually sit and eliminate. So now we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the ways that we address it. Um, and there are two main areas here. Um, the first one, if your child is having this bowel and bladder dysfunction, the first thing we always want to do is take care of the constipation. Um, and that is through changing our nutrition or hydration. And then there are also some exercises that I'll go through that can sometimes just help to get things moving right off the bat. And then the second part to address those causes um, outside of constipation, you know, why the constipation occurred, um, why they might be having pelvic floor issues. It's um, this area called urotherapy. And that just essentially describes any treatment for bladder issues that does not include um, pharmacological treatment or surgical treatment. So nice conservative treatments, lifestyle changes, um, time voiding, and then pelvic floor retraining. So we're gonna go a little more in depth into both of those. First, to address the constipation, um, general exercise is always really highly recommended. When we're moving and our blood is pumping, things are moving in our digestive system as well. So we really encourage just overall movement breaks at home as well. Um, going on walks outside even, going to the park, just getting your child up and moving. Um, but of course, being in Chicago, we know the weather doesn't always permit for going outside. Um, so some fun things you can do indoor. Um, there's a lot of songs on Spotify or YouTube um, or other websites that have like a freeze dance. Or if you're happy and you know it, you like stomp your feet and jump up and down. Just fun instructions that will get the child moving. Um, and then, of course, on our website, we do always have um, movement exercise ideas related to that month's um, lesson plan. So that's always a good resource to look at, um, see what ideas we have and see if you can get your child moving a little bit. Another really great one is yoga. Um, if you have even just like looking up yoga poses online or um, there's an app called Super Stretch that our kids love and it just takes them through some nice easy yoga poses. Um, this can be really good just to get things moving in the digestive system and to get that pelvic floor nice and relaxed to help um, things pass through. Um, we will go more in depth into specific poses later. Um, but then we also have these two um, manual techniques that I'll go through. If your child does seem to be having um, some constipation, these are just some nice things that can help get things moving. So the first one is this I love you massage. I really like this one because it's so easy to remember. Essentially, you're spelling out the letters for I love you on the child's stomach um, from their perspective. So it will be upside down to you. Um, so starting in the top left corner of their tummy, sort of right below rib cage, just drawing down a line like an I. For the L, you go across the rib cage and then follow that same path down for the L. And then for the U, you start on the bottom left corner and you just draw almost like a rainbow shape. Um, and I will show a video of this also. So. so this is the I love you massage. So I start top right corner, nice firm pressure down. And then I go straight across rib cage and follow the path down again. And then I do the entire thing, a nice rainbow or U shape. I'll play that one more time. This can be really helpful. It's almost simulating the movement through the colon. 
And it also just feels really nice um, on a constipated tummy. It really helps with that abdominal discomfort. The second manual technique is something called bicycle legs. It's essentially um, also just creating some movement in the digestive tract and helping to relax some of the hip muscles. Let's see if this lets me play it. Mm. Let me try that again. I might have to. Okay, so essentially you're just bringing one knee at a time up past their hip and then relaxing it back down, doing the same thing with the other leg. If you do that a few times, you can um, maybe add even just a little bit of pressure on the front of the shin. And then you can also do both legs um, and even with a little separation of the knees just to try to relax those pelvic muscles. Oh man, clicked the wrong button. Okay. So another really important area of constipation management is making sure that your child is well hydrated. Um, if things are going through the di digestive tract and they're very dry, it's gonna move a lot slower and it's gonna be a lot harder for them to pass. Um, so a general guideline is one cup of water for every time they urinate. Um, that can be just a nice way to remember, okay, my child went potty, now I need to refill their cup. Um, I also want to really important, um, really quickly touch on juice and milk versus water. Juice and milk are not going to be as hydrating as water, and they can sometimes actually contain bladder irritants that can make our symptoms worse. Um, I do know a lot of our kiddos, especially those with sensory sensitivities, sometimes don't tolerate plain water, and the, they'll really only request um, or only drink juice or milk. Um, you can try diluting these beverages as much as they'll tolerate and see if you can increase that dilution. But if this is the case, um, it's really important to also talk to a nutritionist to see if they do um, have a sensitivity to something in the juice or milk and if this could be one of the sources of their bladder or bowel issues. Um, and we also happen to have a nutrition therapist on staff, Audrey. Um, she works, I think, with children at all locations. So if you do think that your child might have trouble with their nutrition or hydration, um, I have her email at the end of the presentation. Feel free to reach out to her or you can reach out to the case manager if you think that um, nutrition services would be something your child would benefit for from. Um, in terms of nutrition, just a nice general guideline. Obviously, we want to increase fiber. Um, and we can do that with introducing fruits and veggies. Doesn't necessarily have to be whole raw fruits. Even just applesauce can be really helpful um, to introducing that fiber. Fruit leathers, um, and even just replacing grains with whole grains is a really good way to get fiber in there. Um, but again, a nutrition therapist or a nutritionist is gonna be um, a great resource. Other ways to help with bowel and bladder dysfunction are to work on strengthening and relaxation. So strengthening will be focused towards the pelvic floor muscle, but can also have the core actually worked on. There's a lot that the core and the pelvic floor muscles do together because they are essentially postural muscles. They keep you upright, they keep your organs upright where they're supposed to be. And with strengthening, you're moving around and you're improving your digestive tract in that manner. With relaxation, that's going to promote that your pelvic floor muscles can actually relax and elongate when you when you're, we, you or your child are trying to have a bowel movement or to void. 
So strengthening ideas are going on hands and knees, sitting on an exercise ball. This one's one of my favorite ones to do with children because they actually get that proprioceptive input to their, to their pelvic floor when they're sitting. You can have them practice like pushing down and relaxing their pelvic floor muscle. And you'll, they'll know that they're doing the right job if they can actually feel a yoga ball on their pelvic floor area. Or you can also do this within a chair. And that's great feedback to know if you're actually bearing down. Bridges are also a way to work your core and being able to work on your balance. Because again, balance has to do a lot with posture and you need your core and your pelvic floor muscles engaged in order to maintain an upright position and not fall. Here's another video. Um, this is just gonna contain those exercises that Nyla talked about um, and have a couple more ideas. So like she said first, hands and knees position is really good to work on. You can just have them resting this position, reading a book or playing with toys, um, or you can have them do some tasks. So anything reaching, if they're doing a puzzle, if they're grabbing crayons to do a coloring, um, any kind of like reaching or stacking task. What you don't want to see is what I'm about to do in this video, this huge rotation and reaching where my shoulders are turning a whole lot. Um, that you don't want to see. So if you see that a lot, then you can bring it back down to just having an activity in front of them in hands and knees. Um, the next one, if this one is too easy, if it ever loads. Another fun one that you can do is including their legs in it. So if you have a ball, you can have them try to kick the ball behind them. Um, if you have like a little tower of foam blocks, they can try to kick that down. Um, the legs moving is gonna be a little bit more challenging than the arms. So um, this is just another idea if, if they start to get bored with that one. kicks there. Again, you don't want to see like a ton of hip rotation with this one. Um, that might mean it's a little too hard. So this one is one of those exercise ball activities. Um, they can just sit still on it or like Nyla said, try pushing down into the ball. Um, or they can do some activities like reaching across to stack toys, um, reaching side to side to grab toys, um, or puzzle pieces, you know, whatever kind of toy or um, item that your child is interested in, you can put it on either side and have them try to reach down without lifting their foot up. Um, this is just gonna really challenge the balance and even bring some awareness to the um, pelvic floor, which can make it easier to control. This is a more advanced one again, if those are starting to get easy or if you just need more ideas and have them try to pick up their feet to kick a ball or try to set their foot on top of um, something without falling down. So just a little bit of a, a harder challenge for their balance system, which will include those pelvic floor muscles. These are bridges. Um, so the child will just sit um, or lay flat on their back, have their knees bent and try to lift their bottom up. A way that we do it a lot of times at Bluebird is I will drive a little car or truck and tell them to open the tunnel and they will lift their bottom up and try to drive. I try to drive the little car underneath their hips so that they have to hold them up. And then balance. So this video is going to show me standing on a balance disc. Um, I'm sure you guys do not have balance discs at home. So if you want to have them stand on a couch cushion on the floor or even like a thicker pillow, anything that's going to be a little wobbly and make them work a little harder to stand up, they can reach and grab things while standing on it um, or try to kick something um, or even just stand still if that's enough of a challenge. Um, just anything, like I said, that is going to 
make those postural muscles kick in um, is going to be really great for awareness of the pelvic floor, control of the pelvic floor, and making sure it's strong enough um, to really support those organs. Um, this is, if they really want a nice challenge to their balance, you can have them put little toys on top of their feet um, and try to pick them up just to have a little bit of single leg balance. And then moving on to relaxation. So breathing is a big component to the relaxation. Our kids are running around, having a lot of fun, and probably getting dysregulated in some shape or form, and now it's time to use the bathroom. So breathing is a wonderful way to have your child stop and reset. Reset their body, take a moment to go and eliminate on the toilet. Um, yoga and stretching are also great components to that because breathing is essentially in yoga. We have to be able to, to uh, take in all of those big movements and know when to breathe in and breathe out as, as a child is moving around. Stretching also can help out with stretching out the pelvic floor muscles because if a child is voluntarily holding their bowels and bladder, then the pelvic floor muscles might actually get overtrained and the stretching will help relax the muscles, just kind of how a runner might essentially get tight calves or tight hamstrings because of all the exercise that they're doing. So stretching will help elongate and let you move through that range of motion again as a runner. So with pelvic floor, when you're stretching out your pelvic floor muscles by doing hip opening stretches, you're able to elongate the pelvic floor and have that range of motion return so that you can relax, breathe, and eliminate. So a good belly breath exercise is to actually have your child lay down on the floor. And you can call this like tummy volcano, where you have a toy or cotton balls or anything that can balance on their stomach. And the child, when they inhale, they're going to be expanding their abdomen, pushing the toy up into the air. And then when they exhale, it's gonna come down towards their spine. And if the toy doesn't seem like enough, you can actually put your hands around the child's abdomen as that tactile cue for them to be able to breathe into your hands. And then when it's time to exhale, you just give them a little squeeze and they'll get to know when it's time to compress their stomach and, and exhale, let their breath out. And then with yoga, these are just a couple of fun poses that you can do. Happy baby is a really good one for a hip opening stretch. And so is mouse pose. Downward dog will absolutely work the hamstring muscles and that will go into positioning for the toilet too. So if you don't have enough hamstring length where your position on the toilet is compromised, then you can't actually give the pelvic floor muscles an opportunity to work through their full range of motion to relax. Jackie's gonna go over the positioning in the next couple slides. Uh, frog pose, again, a great pose to be able to squat down and really open up those hips, stretch out the pelvic floor muscles and be able to maintain your balance too. So we can throw in some core with, with this pose. So these, these are really great hip opening stretches that uh, anyone can do to help with their pelvic floor muscle. Okay, so another really big part of that urotherapy that we talked about before um, is these lifestyle changes and timed voiding. So if you do have a child who will get really caught up in play and just does not want to stop to go to the bathroom and is holding their bladder all the time, which is causing accidents, it's important to initiate toileting every two to three hours. Um, this also goes for those kids who might 
be suffering from bowel bladder dysfunction already and have that reduced sensation and don't realize that their bladder is full. Um, so two to three hours is sort of on the generous end, <laughs> probably trying closer to two hours or if it just seems like it's been a while since they've gone potty, um, just trying to initiate that and sort of tell them, you know, first potty and then we can return to whatever we're doing. Um, it's also important to track the frequency of their BMs, um, any BM accidents, and then also the consistency of that BM. I know we're not always loving to take a little peek in the bowl afterwards, but that Bristol scale that um, Nyla went over, it is really important to notice if your child is having these really small pellet-like stools or if it's um, pretty large in diameter and has like cracks on the edges, that's a really big indication that they are suffering for con from constipation um, and that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, there are some apps that will allow for really easy and convenient tracking of BMs because it, it's time consuming just taking your child to the potty. So I know we don't wanna add a lot of tasks on top of that. Um, but the Daily Connect app that we actually already use at Bluebird also is really convenient. Um, and as soon as you put potty in, it asks you the consistency um, and the color even. So if we already have that app um, on your devices, that can be a really convenient one to use. It's also really important just to make sure we have the right approach when we're starting toilet training so that we avoid things like aversion to the potty, um, or just a misunderstanding of how to go about potty. Um, some children will try pushing even when they're urinating, which can cause some pelvic floor dysfunction. So making sure that your child is ready to start toileting, um, that's where this child-led component comes in. There should be certain signs of readiness before we initiate toilet training, like children should be staying dry for two hours at a time. Um, they should have some desire to go on the potty. Um, if they aren't showing any signs of readiness and you start toilet training pretty rigorously, that can be a little bit um, stressful for the child and can actually sometimes cause a little bit of aversion to the potty, um, especially if they're sitting for a really long time and sitting on there really frequently. So we really wanna make sure that we're going about it the right way. If your child is really sensitive um, to the potty, if it's like too loud for them or um, just all the sights and smells that go on in the bathroom, making sure that it's a nice environment that um, sort of addresses those needs. So if um, the fan is really loud or if the light is really bright, we found sometimes at Bluebird, we leave the lights off and children might have a little bit more success on the potty, um, making sure that they're you know, isn't a super heavy perfume smell in the bathroom, um, or if the seat is really cold, maybe having like a little seat cover, um, just sort of paying attention to what your child is sensitive to and making sure that that's um, a nice environment for them. It's also important that we allow them to relax on the potty. As, we saw, as we've already gone over, um, it's really important for them to relax their muscles. And that's gonna be hard if they feel rushed um, or if they feel tense on the potty. So making sure that they have a lot of time that we're you know, sort of speaking to them in a relaxing manner. Um, and they can even practice that diaphragmatic breathing on the toilet. That's really good for helping to relax. Um, Sometimes we'll bring like a little pinwheel to the potty and have them practice blowing the pinwheel. That's a really good way to slow down our breathing. You can do kazoos or whistles um, or even do like silly little breaths like doing a lion roar after a big breath. Um, that can be really fun for kids and just help them relax a little bit. And then of course, when we're doing toilet training, making sure that we're sort of treating it with a reward system rather than punishment. So if they do have an accident, making sure that we're not scolding, if they have success on the potty, um, having like a treat or a reward to sort of reinforce that. Um, scolding for accidents can sometimes cause a, a miscommunication where children will think, okay, I, I went potty and I got in trouble for it, so I'm just not gonna go potty at all. And that can make them hold and hold and hold and worsen that dysfunction. We also wanna make sure that they're sitting properly on the toilet to promote this relaxation as well. Um, so any kind of footstool, if you have the squatty potty, if you just have like 
textbooks that you want to put next to the toilet, just anything that's going to prop their feet up to where their knees are slightly above the hips. Um, as you can see from these pictures, there's this big sling muscle that's part of the pelvic floor. And if it's not in the right position, it almost acts to close off the colon. So we wanna make sure that the knees are a little above the hips and that can open everything up, make it a lot easier to relax. Um, we also wanna make sure pants are pulled past the knees, um, pretty much as low as you can get them, like down to ankles. Um, if they're up high or over the knees still, the legs won't be able to separate properly. And when your knees are open, it's a lot easier to relax. If their knees are closed in by their pants or underwear, it's going to make it really hard for them to relax also. And then making sure, you know, for our really small kiddos, if their hips are small to the point where they have to hold themselves up on the potty to not fall into the bowl, they're not going to be able to relax. Um, and then another good guideline is when we're first learning how to pee on the potty, regardless of, you know, boy or girl, we usually like to start seated just so that we can learn how to fully relax. Um, it's a lot easier when we're sitting rather than standing. So when we're first learning this, it is good to start sitting. I wanna make a, another point about the squatty potty before we move on to the next slide. So aside from putting the pelvic floor muscle into a good position to open up, having some support on your feet will shut the core off because like I said previously, the core muscles and your pelvic floor muscles work together. And if there isn't anything underneath your feet when you're trying to, to eliminate, your core muscles turn on because essentially your body is sensing that it's not grounded. It doesn't have any support, so it has to turn on to keep you upright. So having that squatty potty is very essential in being able to eliminate, not just for kids that have dysfunction, but just anyone in general. So if your child's feet are dangling off of the floor or when they're sitting and they're dangling off that toilet, their core muscles are turned on and their pelvic floor is not having that opportunity to relax. That's a great point. Thank you, Nyla. And also if you already have like a step stool for hand washing, just scooting that over to the toilet when they're sitting can be helpful. So in general, physical therapy is very effective for addressing constipation and even bladder issues. So all these things that we talked about, there have been a lot of studies that have shown it has been very effective in improving symptoms, um, even more effective than if the child was receiving um, like laxatives and standard medical care. It's important to combine that with physical therapy to make sure that you're addressing um, the causes of their constipation or the causes of their um, bladder dysfunction. If you're just addressing the very last part, that constipation with the laxative, but you're not treating the underlying causes, odds are it is going to recur. Um, but then, of course, if, if they are having this um, constant constipation and it's not improving, or if they're really having a lot of UTIs, that is definitely something that you're going to want to talk to their uh, pediatrician about. So anything like that, of course, bring up with their primary care. And I will now open the floor to questions. Um, and if you have anything that uh, you don't want to ask here, um, feel free to shoot either me or Nyla an email. And then I also have included um, Audrey, the nutrition therapist's information here. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question um, for my son who really struggles to go party when he goes out, as in, was, as in when we travel, we go to a new place, um, he ends up just holding on to his party. So um, do you have any suggestions for that? Like I've social stories, I've tried, um, you know, like uh, speaking to him before, what we, uh, before our travel, um, telling him that it's okay to, you know, go party in a different place, a different environment. Um, yeah, so that's my. Nyla, do you have any 
thoughts on this one? So <clears throat> as, as, a public, as a public floor therapist, specifically with physical therapy, uh, this one is a hard one for just PT to address. And I, I definitely understand that it's not easy being able to control an environment that's outside of your home. So having those environmental changes is, is difficult because you can't, you can't make it as comfortable as you can at home. Um, one thing that I have resorted to with some of my previous clients is, is having modifications as best as they can. And I know that screen time is not always the best option, but in a moment where you need your child to relax and be comfortable, that could be your last resort. Um, you can have a favorite book that they like to read along with you when you are traveling. And as, instead of using a screen, being able to have the child um, read their favorite book while they're in the bathroom in this public unknown place. Um, and my, I guess my final suggestion would actually be looking into getting a travel squatty potty. There are some that can fold up and that you can keep in your car so that when you are traveling or you're going to an unknown location, you don't know how high the toilet is going to be. And the squatty potty can help your child ground their feet and at least promote some kind of relaxation for, for um, their body. But I think I would absolutely reach out. I would reach out to my um, occupational therapist or my behavioral therapist and helping figure out how specifically for your child, because all children are different, but how can we specifically help your child be okay with these outside environmental changes? Uh, yes, uh, so there's a question about if it's helpful to have a parent facilitate feet to knee position in a public potty. Absolutely, if you're comfortable with going down onto the floor and having your thigh be your child's squat, squatty potty, that is totally fine because you can bring up the feet to the knee. We have Kelly Frank that said, behavioral therapists could create a social story about going potty in public places. Yes, so I know that um, in your special situation here, you have used social stories, um, but maybe even bringing the social story along with you aside from a book can Sure, uh, Na Naima, I think uh, the squatty, the travel squatty potty idea is, is a great suggestion. I think just raising that height and mm -hmm. making him feel comfortable might, might just help out. I, I should try that. Yeah, just trying to make it as comfortable as possible. And yeah. when the parent is there, it could be more reassuring too that sure. they're in a safe spot. Uh, hi, I have a question. So um, my question is kind of like the same, but um, my daughter is like uh, not uh, going party at school, in public school. So uh, she will hold it, like not even go pee at school. She will hold it like all day long. Do you suggest that if I should give her like water or in the morning or not giving her any like too much of it so that she won't like pee her pants at school like something like that she she's um she's try i think um like for the social story and i tried like everything to make her feel comfortable to go party at school but i do not think that helps sometimes when come uh, when she comes back home she will say i did go party at school but I talked to a teacher, she's actually lying. So mm -hmm. I wonder if there's like anything could help with that. Like, should I limit it the uh, intake of water in the morning so that she won't like feel, feel like she needs to go at school? Um, I can suggest to eliminate water because having water is super essential for anyone to be hydrated. And we don't want to eventually have this end up being a situation where your daughter is now constipated mm -hmm. and you're dealing with something a little bit bigger. Um, now, my, my question before I dive into this a little bit more, um, is your daughter 
uh, someone at Bluebird or? Ah,、uh, she's in、yeah. IS Landing. She works、nice. in Bluebird before.、Okay. She's go、uh, sh- like in Bluebird or IS Landing. She can go to the party with no problem. <laughs> But in her school, like with more kids around her, okay, she she might feel like more intimidated or it's not so familiar. Yeah, because like in public school, they they have like more kids in one classroom. I think that's that's also the reason. Mm-hmm. Because in Bluebird Day or IS Landing, they it's kind of like small group of students that she gets along like all day long. So she knows them, she's fine. But like in her school right now, like there are too many students going around, and she's not so familiar with some of them. So she might feel like not safe enough to go there.、Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so that so with your child being someone that is outside of Bluebird, my answer to that is. Collaborating with her teacher so that she can be on a void schedule that she's able to go. If she's uncomfortable with being around her peers when she's going to the bathroom, giving her the opportunity to go when there aren't any peers around. Starting starting with that, and then we can build up into her being comfortable waiting with other peers in the area.、Uh, sometimes schools have a nurse's office, so that it's just one toilet. That a child can go to, as opposed to a stall where anybody can just come into the bathroom. So some of my my patients,、um, that's been very helpful while we're dealing with their incontinence.、Um, and if we connect, I can help problem solve a couple more things for you. And if the teacher is a, a little bit more resistant to collaborating with you and helping out with making sure that your daughter is. Sitting down to to avoid and relax, then sometimes a little a little push or conversation from the PT can can help、uh, the teacher be able to collaborate with with you in this treatment. That's essentially very important because we don't we don't want our kids holding their their urine all day and having to rush home and and go or and possibly having accidents. But definitely don't restrict the hydration. That's super、okay. important.、Um, okay. But if you would like to connect and we can keep talking about this, I am absolutely open to doing that for you. Thank you, because I, I am myself actually an occupational therapy student、okay. at UIC. So I do have like I I do ask like different therapists about these questions, but I try like different methods as well. But it's not actually helping. I was hoping like maybe I can get some advice from the PT as well. Yeah. Okay.、Um, how about we we set up some time to discuss one on one. And collaborate a little bit more because it, every child is very different, and there's different components that don't apply to one child like it would for another. Great, thank you, thank you so、yeah. much. Do we have any other questions? Yes.、Uh... Hi, my name is Mario.、Um, my son goes to、uh, Blueberry, and、uh, his name is Sebastian.、Um, the issue that I have with him、uh, when、um, when when it comes to going to number one, he has no problem. Sometimes he goes by himself,、um, and sometimes I tell him, "Come on, let's go, let's go do number one," and he'll do it with no problem. He'll pull up his pants down, his、uh, pull-ups. But when and when after he does number one. I tell him, okay, let's try number two, and he will not, he won't do it. He will not stay on the, on the toilet.、Um, and sometimes I like leave him during the day, like during the weekend. The weekends I leave him without with no pull-ups and just、uh, with a regular underwear. And I will notice it, like okay,、um, I take him to the bathroom. He doesn't want to go.、Um, It's just it's really resistant to staying on the toilet, even when he has like、uh, you mentioned、uh, like screen time. He will not stay on there, and as soon as I put the the pull up on, he goes number two on the pull up. Something so something so, I. So going to see if you have any for like. I think、um, 
sometimes if kids are really used to just going in their pull-up, they associate that just with the pull-up. Um, so if he's really used to going number two, something that I've tried that's helped sometimes is if they go number two in the pull-up, then taking it and dumping it into the potty and having them flush it down the potty just to build a connection, you know, BMs go in the toilet. Um, and then even sometimes like trying to put the pull-up over the toilet bowl and seeing if they'll go on that so that they're still sitting on the toilet but going onto a pull-up. That could be something to try. Nyla, I don't know if you have any other suggestions. Um, yeah, I think those, that's a really good suggestion. Or even, like you said, being in the pull-up but sitting on the toilet as a as a small baby step to being able to avoid or defecate uh, once they're sitting on the toilet without the pull-up. And just using some of the tools that um, just like the squatty potty to be able to sit and relax um, on the toilet. But if the pull-up is, is a comfortable spot, seeing how we can progress from there. But I, I like that suggestion of sitting on the toilet with the pull-up on as a first step. All right, thank you. Hi, um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So my daughter is four and a half years old and she currently attends Bluebird. And um, it's kind of similar to the um, what the gentleman was just saying, uh, but my daughter, um, you know, she, they, even at Bluebird, they put her on the potty um, and she sits there, but never, I think sporadically like pees in the potty. Um, but most of the time after she's even here at home and I do put her on the potty, um, and I take her off, put her pull up back on, um, that's when she'll end up going either, um, the one or number two. And so I don't know. Um, and that's another thing, like, I don't know if she's ready for the potty because I've tried it before and it kind of, it didn't work out because I was giving her the water, the water, and uh, she just kept going in, in her pull-up instead of the potty. So I just, I don't know if I'm just not timing it right or if she's just not ready, but, I, you know, she's four and a half years old and I kind of want want to push her a little bit to start going to the potty because she's getting kind of big for the pull-ups and everything. So I need help. <laughs> yeah. Um, readiness in general, I'm, I'm not sure if you've talked to her team at Bluebird about readiness, um, but there are, there are definitely a couple of things that we want to see before we start toilet training, um, just that indicate a little bit of bladder control and a little bit of understanding. Um, so if, if the child is very frequently wet, um, like they can't stay dry in a pull-up for two hours at a time. Um, if it's like every single hour you take them to the potty, they're always wet. Um, that can indicate potentially not um, being physiologically ready to toilet train. Um, if they also just can't tell the difference between the wet and dry sensation, um, or if they don't recognize um, when it's time to go, if they don't show any kind of like pulling or like tugging at their pull up, or if if they um, are squatting, even when they're going in their pull-up, that's a good sign. Um, but if they just sort of go about their day and don't seem to even recognize that there's a need to go, um, or if they don't even recognize that they've already gone, um, that can sometimes be an indication that they're maybe not ready. Um, and in these populations, it does unfortunately sometimes just happen a little bit later. Um, so that could be something to talk to her team about. Um, Nyla, if you have any thoughts. Okay. Um, I guess one other thought, and this could also apply to, um, to Omar, right? where if the toilet is just a very intimidating spot to begin with, uh, if we take a step back and maybe try some of the training toilets that there are for children. They're lower to the ground, they're cuter, they look fun. Um, and 
aside from that, because they are lower to the ground, it's going to promote that deep squat that can fully relax and elongate the pelvic floor muscles. So that could also be a starting point for testing the waters, assuming that your child does show some potty readiness skills. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually tried um, the, the smaller potty and then um, she was, you know, she's getting too big for that one. Mm -hmm. um, so then I kind of uh, went and um, changed it over to the ones with the rails and has the stepping um stepping um step for her to you know um, bend her knees and um she kind of seemed a little bit more intimidated on that one um but the little one she doesn't really quite fit in it anymore because she's Stay comfortable. so big <laughs> yeah okay um yeah I, I just continue to resort back to making going to the bathroom a fun experience a, a safe experience because the, the times that I was not successful with helping a child learn how to um, control their bowel and bladder were all the times that it seemed like they were forced to be in my office. And, and those, those sessions, those treatments took a long time. So it's very essential that, that uh, your child doesn't feel intimidated by just the act of going to the bathroom. And this, I would fall towards my OT friends all the time with asking how can I help make this a better sensory experience for any child that couldn't tolerate, not just like the smell of an overperfumed bathroom, but the smell of poop actually coming out. Like how can we modify modify that so that my child is okay being able to defecate? How can I make their body feel all right with stool coming out? And a big part of that was drinking water and making sure that their poop was nice and soft so that it didn't hurt when it came out. But if a child's already experienced a very hard stool and it was painful, they're not going to want to do it again. So it's going to take some patience and and trust in you as a parent for that child to be able to try defecating again when their poops are nice and soft. Also, just really quickly going back to um, the the potty itself, um, if they if she was having success on um, like the little training potty, and she is now on a um, adult sized potty, um, if the the seat itself is too large for her, that, that could be really intimidating and can make it hard to relax. So they actually have like little child seat insets that you just put on top of the bowl that can make it the right size for her. I'm not sure if um, it is an adult size toilet or if that could be a potential source of um, trouble. Okay, yeah, I um I actually was able to take the seat off the smaller um the the smaller potty and put it on top of the um of the other um uh, one that, that I have with the rails to try to make it, you know, not so scary for her cuz yeah, she probably felt like she was going to fall through. Um but um I just, you know, every time, I, like I said, like even at uh, Bluebird, when they do take her to the potty, um, they take her to the potty, but then, you know, she doesn't really um, um, void or anything um, while she's sitting on the potty. It'll be afterwards when she has her pull up back on. So I will definitely reach out to my OTs, uh, to the OT that I have for her and um, just see if I can get some... Um, other methods that I can work with her on. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I have a question. We really struggle with um, the idea she understands like what it is in the process, um, but she just like doesn't want to. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And actually we had a situation last night that I found very fascinating because um, we had a little kitty cat in the house and the kitty cat was laying in the bathroom and we put the litter box in the bathroom. It was a new, a new situation. <laughs> <laughs> just sort of like that as new kitty cats usually are um and she was in the bathroom for a while hanging out in there with this kitty cat and then all of a sudden was like oh, i'm gonna show this kitty cat how to go potty and like in the potty she sat down she pulled down her pants and she peed in the potty and we were just like what just happened because usually there's m&ms involved there's a bribe there's like a whole kind of deal but it was almost like as soon as it was like on her terms it was it was just really fascinating to watch and I was curious like if you had any inspiration as to how we maybe can keep the ball rolling because it's it feels like when it's our idea it's like a terrible idea we just get no <laughs> you know so and you know we had a thing where we were doing it like on the hour or on the every two hours and it just got really contentious and it became like super negative so we switched gears from that and just kind of tried modeling hey do you want to come potty with me while I go potty and it became like a fun thing that we were doing this thing together but then eventually she was just like nah I don't want to do that <laughs> so um but she actually you and when she would come with me she'd model the whole routine of sitting down and wiping and flushing and do the whole thing but then would be like okay I'm done <laughs> and watching her in the whole thing but having not gone so it was really fascinating that she actually went last night and I'm curious if you have any ideas for maybe how to keep that ball rolling or if there's any insights that maybe I haven't thought about there are not you oh go ahead um, what I want to say that that's actually a really good idea and being able to be in the bathroom and literally do anything else but go to the bathroom, having, okay. making it a comfortable experience where this is a room where I can, can I can have fun it. in, I can be safe in and, <laughs> and yeah, not having it be an idea that we're pushing on her is, okay. is very key. But I think I would continue to suggest um, just doing some fun activities in the bathroom, maybe okay. dropping some some food coloring into the toilet, watch the water change, um, mm -hmm. having some fun in the sink, like playing with soap, playing with shaving cream, anything that she's not tactilely defensive about now. Um, it's a good way. I'm having a very hard time not saying your child's name. I know. It's okay. We don't <laughs> care. We are talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, having those fun experiences. Or even if you're doing something in the bathroom, don't invite her. And just make a big fuss about it. And we'll see if she eventually wanders in there and, and wants okay. to join you. And then just, like you said, keep that ball rolling and making the bathroom a fun experience. Okay. Cause it, yeah, the conversation was like super helpful and fun. Cause she used to get constipated, but she doesn't anymore. She's like very on the reg. So all those tips will be helpful when all of that comes up, but it seems like it's not a physical thing. It's like a, I don't, like a, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> a lot of other things, you know, I don't know, but yeah, you know, yeah. Yes, and I, I definitely understand because then again, that's that's where I saw a lot of my difficult cases when a child was forced to be with me and learn how to use the bathroom again or use the bathroom for the first time at a more than above average uh, potty training time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> or kitty cats more bathroom time yeah yeah <laughs> throwing some glitter in the toilet you know she actually like in the bathtub we had those like color you know she's very she was very against the colored water thing mm. at first. I don't yeah. we should probably try it again because like she's very opinion about, about things at the start and then if you do it a couple of times and she can control it it gets a little bit better but yeah Okay, I can definitely continue this conversation with uh, with you and not just you, but the rest of her team since I see them okay. every day. 
every day <laughs> all the days well thank you so much for putting this together i know that it's like after hours i really appreciate it all these tips will come in super helpful like on the reg for all of us so i really appreciate it no problem that's what we're hoping for yeah cool okay um if anyone doesn't have any other questions um, or if there's just a little bit more in depth that you'd like to go into the conversation again, please feel free to email either Jacqueline or myself. Um, if it's nutrition based, please reach out to Audrey. Nutrition is such a big key in keeping our kids from being constipated and just further prolonging these bowel and bladder issues. But thank you everybody for Coming to our presentation, we really do hope that this was helpful for everyone and that you at least took one thing out of, out of the presentation that's going to help you moving forward. All right. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.